Well, we're very pleased that we have Dr. Bal Carter today, who was the uh, co-chairman for the Guideline on Detection of Prostate Cancer. It came out at this meeting, and we have a few questions we're going to go with him for the times today. So thank you for coming, Dr. Carter. Thank you. How does the guideline differ from the best practice statement that we had previously? You know, the best practice statement uh, came out in 2009, and it was a statement that addressed PSA testing not only for diagnosis, but also for risk stratification and for management of prostate cancer. Additionally, the best practice statement did not use a formal systematic literature review like the current guideline did. And lastly, the best practice statement um, based recommendations often on opinions and values and not just evidence-based. Gotcha. So is that more of a consensus-based uh, document than the guidelines? Correct. Okay. Now, I've heard this said, and I think you've heard it said too, was this just a reaction to the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommendation? So definitely not, because our process uh, began two years ago at the AUA meeting in Washington, D.C., when the AUA asked uh, for the development of an evidence-based guideline on, on prostate cancer detection. It was one year after the meeting in Washington, D.C. in Atlanta mm -hmm. that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force issued their grade D recommendation. So t one year before their recommendation, we were already working on a guideline. Now, it might be good for the leadership to hear a little bit about what were the differences in your findings or your panel's findings for the age group 55 to 69 and the U.S. Preventative Task Force recommendations for that same age group. Yes. So the task force uh, concluded, based on their review of the evidence, that um, the, the, the service should be discouraged. The service being PSA testing. Don't even discuss it. Should be discouraged for all age groups. Mm -hmm. All races um, do not use this test. Mm -hmm. The current guideline is, is very different in that we are not discouraging the use of the PSA test. Uh, we identified a group of individuals aged 55 to 69 where there is the best evidence that benefits may outweigh harms. And in identifying that group, uh, we believe we should be focusing our efforts on that group. You could call it targeted screening because they are the men most likely to benefit. We, we did not say that there were men in other age groups who will not benefit. There are men in other age groups who may benefit. But this is the whole process of shared decision making that needs to take place between a patient and, and, and a physician. So that's good that uh, you're given a better explanation. So if you've taken that same age group, rather than giving a grade D recommendation, on your panel, you would have said C. Is that true? So we would have given it a C. We would have, we would have, as we did, emphasized shared decision making for the age group 55 to 69. There are some who believe, and certainly there's been some data to suggest this, that maybe the younger patients, that is 40 to 55, and remembering that we're going back to where we've recommended starting at 40, wait, this is a, a departure from that. Now, from 40 to 55, you've got some men with high-risk features, for instance, and I say just high-risk in that it could be family history, African-American men. Are you discouraging a conversation with this guideline in those men? So this is a complicated issue because we know that we can test at an earlier age mm -hmm. and we can identify some men based on their PSA level that are at higher risk of developing prostate cancer later on. That's a different question mm -hmm. than, than the question if we were to detect it in a four-year-old versus waiting until they reach age 55, have we improved any health outcome? Mm -hmm. So our problem in struggling with that question was we do not have any high-level evidence that if we start screening early, we are going to improve health outcomes. But having said that, mm -hmm. in the younger man who is at higher risk, he had, perhaps has a family history, he may be African-American, we strongly believe that 
a shared decision should a shared decision uh, making should take place between the patient and the physician, the patient who's at higher risk, right. and then they decide together whether screening is for them. Yeah. So we're not summarily dismissing PSA in that group of patients. Absolutely not. Good. I think that's good for clarification because that's been a misunderstanding, I believe. It has been a misunderstanding, and the word that should be emphasized is routine. Mm -hmm. We're not recommending routine screening of the average risk man. Now, when we start talking routine screening and then possibly extending the time between screenings, what are your thoughts about that, and did you address that in the guidelines? We did. We felt that there was evidence to suggest that every other year screening would be as effective as annual screening in terms of benefits, but also reduce harms by reducing the number of false positive tests and the number of unnecessary biopsies. So we did make the recommendation that one way to reduce harm was to increase the interval between tests. Getting away maybe from the guideline per se, and getting down to some of the complicated issues that this guideline is going to bring up. One question that's been raised fairly often for the people I talk to is, what do I do with the man that is outside the recommended screening age group? So a 70-year-old man. I've been following in my practice now for five or six years. PSA 7, had two previous biopsies, but now I feel like I've got this elevated PSA, haven't found the cancer yet, I'm still concerned, What's your recommendation? How do we handle, how do we recommend we handle those for the practicing neurologist? Yeah, it, that is a very good question. And I don't think there's a one size fits all. I mean, I think the patient and the physician sit down together. The, the, the physician is, want, is going to want to know, well, what did those biopsies show? Right. Was there PIN? Was there atypia? Uh, the physician is, is going to want to know what was the PSA history. Mm -hmm. um, did the biopsy get triggered but because there were PSA levels that were a little higher and now they're much lower? Um, and then what's the comorbidity of this individual? If he's had five heart attacks, he's obese, he's got diabetes, well maybe uh, it's time not to follow that guy so carefully. But I think it's urologists are very, very good at um, determining whether or not a person is going to benefit from treatment and I think that's an individual decision. And you know, one of the things that's come out of the guideline that has concerned people is that many of the people making these decisions are primary care. Right. And that maybe they say summarily now outside of these screening ranges, we're not even going to get PSAs. We've heard that talk actually at several hospitals. What you're saying though, to clarify, is that's not necessarily the case. 70 year old man you've been following for a while and you're still concerned, you'd still have that conversation and you're recommending. Same with the younger patient population on the other side of that curve. But there's also that population that still have very normal PSAs for years that this may actually benefit. You could say, stop. Mm -hmm. There's no use in continuing on. Would you agree with that? Totally. And I think the message is not, you're too old, you don't need screening anymore. The message is, you've maintained a low PSA level all your life. You're now 75. You've beat all the odds. Congratulations. Exactly. That's great. That's a great way to put it. Um, do you think the, the AUA or the guidelines are discarding PSA? Do you think that we're saying, okay, we, we need something better and therefore let's just throw this thing, the baby out with the bathwater? No, I don't. I think, I think PSA is a relatively good test. Um, and, and I think this is the beginning of what I would call targeted screening. We are identifying those men who are most likely to benefit. And as time goes by, we're gonna have other tests be they genetic tests, blood tests, urine tests, that are, that are going to help us even to a greater extent target those who are most likely to benefit. Right. Uh, do you think that uh, the guidelines will help or hurt uh, the AUA and its, and its credibility in that it's such a radical departure from where we were. Start at 40, uh, you have more data points to go on. And now you've gone through all the evidence and have done a great job, an unbelievable job of distilling this down with uh, your index patients. How do you think this actually looks from the standpoint of 
the guidelines and how people perceive the, the AUA taking on this issue? I think this is going to be a very positive step for the AUA because I think we, we the AUA, uh, the board of directors, the, the, the membership of the AUA will be perceived now as a group of individuals who, who very, very carefully looked at the evidence and is trying to do what's right in terms of reducing the harms of screening. We, we, we are all aware that there are harms and obviously there are potential benefits and we're trying to shift that ratio. You know, one of the, the principal concerns that we've heard so often in a variety of committees, societies, talks, have been complications from transrectal ultrasounds and biopsies, and those infectious complications are going up. Uh, do you see this as another potential benefit of maybe avoiding some of those unnecessary biopsies and potential complications? Absolutely. I think this is a, an approach, call it what you want, targeted screening, more focused screening, that will lead to a reduction in unnecessary biopsies and a reduction in the complications of biopsies. Any other areas that you have had to, to field questions from colleagues, from people on, on the uh, committee itself, that you think it would be good for us to take this time to, to clarify? I think one um, additional area that the panel felt fairly strongly about was mass screening. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, we, we've done some of that, all of us have. Hospital systems have done it, um, uh, whether they be church organizations. Um, our focus here was that in outside the context of shared decision making, if a man is not going to hear about the potential benefits and harms, then PS, routine PSA testing should not be done. Yeah. I think we've all uh, heard that we need to have a discussion one of the problems have been those busy, busy practices where people say, you know, I don't have time for that sort of thing. Do you also see this as an opportunity now that we have the evidence to get out some of that in publication format or informational for the patients so that we can inform the patients of what we say now? And that could be given out, distributed from an office, from the mm -hmm. AUA main office, et cetera. Do you see that as, a, as another potential portal? Absolutely. The decision support tools that help uh, patients understand what the benefits and harms are. There's an entire science around how, and how to communicate benefit and harm. And the AUA certainly can be a big part of that. Um, ASCO or the American Society of Clinical Oncology has a very nice decision support tool. And I could see the AUA also taking part in putting together decision support tools. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank We've you. We've enjoyed it. Thank you for your time.